I love this venue. It's just amazing. Um, okay. Uh, now I should be able to start my presentation. Yes. Ah, it's so small. Yeah, okay. Before we start, how many of you have seen my previous talk that started with the same slide? One. Paco, you don't count. Oh, two. Okay, it's fine then. Um, okay, then good that I put a small recap in it, because then <laughs> you're going to need it. Um, so, Kotlin. Kotlin is a multi-platform language, and it was so um, since the very design. And so if you think about it, the fact that Kotlin runs on the JVM is just an implementation detail. Um, and as such, like, it needs to encode its own type information on top of something that is not meant to hold that. For example, in Java, there's no mention of nullability, no mention of um, I don't know, seal classes or uh, name parameters or anything like that, at least not Java 6 and um, stuff like that. So they had to find a way to just hide this information somewhere. And this is where the metadata comes in. So again, Kotlin, how? I'm going to explain you. Um, just a, a little bit of a, so that you understand, um, this talk is especially in the context of annotation processing. So we are going to look at it from the point of view of those APIs. So you're compiling. Your code might not even be, let's say, your types might not be fully formed. So you might have partial types and things like that. What do you see from these APIs? So if in Kotlin you have a list of string, from that side you're going to see a list of string. So that's fine. But if you have a list of nullable string from that API, Again, without looking at the metadata, just pure Java annotation processing, you're going to see a list of string. There's no difference. There's no way to gather the nullability. If you see a mutable list in Kotlin, then on the other side, it's going to be a list of strings. And again, if you have an alias of any kind, alias, 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 um, then it's still going to be a list of strings. Like, everything gets pretty much erased or Let's say it, it's not possible to encode it with the tools given by the JVM and the bytecode. Similar example, a class is a class. That's fine. But an object, it's still a class. Because an object is like a single tool instance, which is both a class and like the single instance that implements that class, right? But from the point of view of the JVM, there's no difference. It's just a class. Data class, it's a class. I think by now you get the gist. So, seal class, it's an abstract class. It's slightly different, but still, <laughs> it's almost there, almost there, yes. Um, yeah, so um, let's, let's look at a concrete example. Like, you have the most simple code you can imagine, which is a very simple data class with one value uh, with a primitive, potentially, int. Um, it's also interesting that in Kotlin, for example, there's no distinction between primitive and non-primitive because that's, again, an implementation detail of the JVM, but in other platforms, it could be different. So if we compile this and then we do this little trick, which is, uh, I don't know if you've ever done this, you can see the bytecode is generated uh, from your code. If you do that, you're going to see this, which makes total sense. It's just clear. Um, and so if you decompile that with a button on the top, then what you're going to see is this, which maybe makes a bit more sense, but I don't know. But the part we're interested in is not the, the implementation, like how they encoded the, the Java logic. It's the extra information, which is this one. They hid all this extra information inside a metadata annotation, um, which contains a lot of what looks like garbage. In particular, what is inside the metadata annotation? There's a few fields. The, so actually, there's more than that. Sometimes they appear, sometimes they don't, depending on what you're encoding. Um, what are they? The kind, which, well, we'll see one by one, but then I'll explain. Um, metadata version, bytecode version, um, data one, which is one place for data, data two, which is another place for data, an extra string, an extra int, and this is new, package name. So what are they? Let's go from the bottom up. Package name, well, it's a fully qualified package name. And you might be wondering, why do I need that? 
because it can be different from Java. It turns out there is, for example, one annotation called JVM package name. Um, you can put it on a Kotlin file, and the Kotlin um, package will differ from the Java package, for example. And again, there's no way to gather that from the bytecode, of course. Um, interesting fact, you cannot put it in a file that has classes. It has to be top-level constructs like functions or objects and things like that, or constants and stuff. So that's one. Then we have the extra int, which is like a sort of an enum. Um, it can main three things, like is this, uh, it's actually a flag, so it can be multiple. Is this a multi-file class uh, facade or part? If you're wondering what is a multi-file class facade or part, so going back to the documentation, there's a way so that you can have um, different files annotated with the same JVM name and make them um, be merged in a single file, Java file, so that from the Java file you can access all of the things that are split into multiple files. So that's what it is. Okay. Um, it can tell you if it's compiled by a pre-release version of Kotlin, uh, which is useful when you want to make sure that it's stable or not, etc. And then, of course, if uh, this is a script or not, because again, there's no way to know just from the bytecode. The other thing is data, data, and extra string. What is inside? It depends. But mostly, uh, it's protocol buffers. Do you know what protocol buffers are? Mostly, but OK. Uh, for those that don't, imagine a JSON-ish format that is, has a schema, a well-defined schema. So it's, let's say, type safe. Um, and it's encoded in a binary format, which is very efficient. So you read these bytes through some code-generated adapters, um, and you get back the information. So that's what's inside there. And then we have metadata version, bytecode version. That's just boring, like whatever. You know that. Um, and then the kind, which is more interesting. Um, so it can be whatever is annotated can be a class. It can be a file, because you know when um, you put top-level constructs in a file, that becomes a class. Like if the file is myfile.kt, it will become myfile.kt by default. You can change that but if you want. And inside, it's going to have like all the top-level stuff. Synthetic class are um, classes generated by the compiler as uh, helper methods for things like lambdas, uh, method references, all that stuff. Um, that's all synthetic. And then multi-file class facade or part, blah, blah, blah. So that's, oh, no, too fast. Uh, wait, I wanted to go back one second, sorry. Um, so you have all of this. And you should remember that this is used by the compiler, is used by the IDE, is used by all the official tools. This was invented uh, by JetBrains, for JetBrains, because it is the way that everything works. And um, the beauty of it is that it's a very stable format. They cannot break it, because if they were to break this, everything Kotlin-related would break. Every library would stop understanding what it's talking about, and like everything would just be very bad. So also, another thing to keep in mind is that this data is still very low level. You get access to information that is even lower level sometimes than uh, what you get from the annotation processing APIs, for example. So um, that's why there have been efforts to try to simplify it a bit. So what do you get? What can you actually see inside of this? Just randomly, but um, in like interesting order. Um, of course, you can get so uh, nullability and also nested nullability. So understanding that an entire list of string can be null or not, you could maybe do it in Java by checking annotations like nullable, things like that. Maybe you could do it. But something like list of nullable string, that is no way, there's no way unless you use this. And even more, like a list of list of nullable string, you can get the nested nullability um, all the way down, essentially. You can get secondary constructors, because as you know, in Kotlin, there's a primary constructor, and then the, all the other ones are secondary. But from the point of view of the JVM, there's no difference. They might not be even in that order. And so if you really want to know which one is the primary constructor, this is the only way. Um, companion object name. 
If you ever try to generate code that tries to be an extension over a companion, you have no way of knowing the companion name unless you use this. You can try to be very optimistic and just say companion, but you can change the name, so this is the way you know. Um, and actually, you can know, um, yeah, whatever. Properties list, so again, there's a difference between like a method called get something and a property called something. Um, it is different in Kotlin, and it is different the way it's implemented in the bytecode, but also properties can have different names um, with respect to their getters. You can have a property called foo and have the getter called bar. And so again, like to associate the two, this is the only way. You cannot guess this. Um, delegated types, you can know if a type is delegated and how, blah, blah, blah. You can know if something is internal, because internal is actually not a thing in the JVM. It's public in the end. What uh, enforces the internal constraints is the Kotlin compiler, nothing else. Um, you can know, finally, what are the direct children of a sealed class. So, you know, um, at runtime, you can have enums, and you can iterate through all the values. That's super useful, and it can allow you to do very nice um, automatic validation. But for sealed classes, there's nothing like that. So if you want to know at compile time exactly what a sealed class can be, this is the way. Um, time paralysis. So you can finally know exactly what things point to. And imagine creating uh, the equivalent of Dagger, but it understands type aliases. So to bind something, you could use type aliases, and it would be a different type, maybe, for that injection framework uh, than the normal type. So that could be really cool. Um, you can know everything about generics, so in, out, star, verified, which again, uh, are mostly concepts that don't map one on one with the JVM, like it depends on the context. You can know everything about classes. Is it a data class? Is it a seal class, an object, a companion, which is a special type of object? So again, you can know everything you want. Um, you can know properties. What is the var? What is the getter? What is the setter? Uh, is it a const? Is it like in it? Everything. Uh, value parameters, like in the methods or constructors, is it a default value parameter? Is it cross in line, if it's in line? Is it no in line, et cetera? And then for functions, you can know, um, is it an operator, infix, inline, tail recursive, external, et cetera? Um, there's more. One side of this is that the protobuf is not really easy to read, and most, like, some of the information is encoded in flags that don't have names attached to them. So, Often, it's about digging into the Kotlin compiler and seeing how it's been used to understand what it actually is. It's not so scary, but still, like, it's not straightforward and documented. So, um, so what happened? Uh, what happened? Um, shut up. No. Uh, <laughs> no, no, no. We're going to get to the applause. Oh, wait a second. So one year ago, I gave pretty much the talk you saw before. Uh, it was a bit longer then, but still. Um, and at the time, I was uh, like just exploring, just playing around with the concept and seeing what is possible to do with this, et cetera. But I had nothing concrete, like no library, no prototype, nothing. And then what happened? It happened that after that talk, actually, I started playing with it and I, even more, and I created this prototype, but I never really shipped it because it was not documented at the time. And, um, and so, despite this, the need for metaprogramming was so strong in the community that after a while, uh, the, the rumors spread that I had created this prototype. And the lovely people of Arrow, actually formerly known as Category, if you've ever seen that before, which is a functional library um, to do true functional programming on Kotlin. It's pretty neat. The problem with that is that there can be sometimes a lot of boilerplate. And the boilerplate you get is just, it takes away a lot of the, the, the magic and the, the nicety about using this functional style. So they were looking um, to find a way to auto generate this code, but in a way that, again, is um, Kotlin, uh, let's say, compatible. Because if you try to take 
any Java code from the annotation processing API and generate Kotlin code, it's not even about trying to be fancy. You might not be able to generate code that compiles at all. Because if you try to return a nullable type where something should be not nullable, it just won't compile, and vice versa. So um, this is really the only way to do it. And so they sort of forced me to, to do another prototype for them. And uh, in more or less an afternoon, I had the first draft ready. And that started kind of a revolution in that sense, because then I published this library, although I never officially uh, advertised it in any way, uh, but people still you know, were finding it and then asking me questions about it. And so I had to add features and stuff. It's horrible. Developers are terrible. Um, and so now, today, they have how many notation processors? 12? Gee. OK, 12 or many more, or I don't know, uh, annotation processors all based on this technology. Um, and they do incredible things. And for example, one of the things that I love the most that I've seen recently is they have an optics library, which sounds scary, but it's actually a way to easily um, update. Um, imagine immutable data structures like data classes that are nested. So if you have a lot of nesting of data classes, and you want to update one of the leaves, you need to do something crazy like you start from one, and then you set the value. But then you set this value to the parent. And then you set that value to the parent, and then that to the parent, and so on and so forth. And it's just ugly to write. With this, one annotation, and you can literally write down the path that you want to update and do it. It's magic. It's really, really nice. So that happened. And then after that, after a while, um, something else came up. I don't know if you're uh, familiar with Moshi from Square. Um, not that Moshi. That's not the actual logo. Um, so they, uh, not actually not Square itself, but um, Zach, uh, he was working on a way to adapt Kotlin types better, because before it was only uh, reflection based. And there's problems with that, of course. Um, so he contacted me trying to find out if he could do it, because they had, for example, the problem that um, a lot of times they just could not gather the nullability, the, the actual names, and things like that. And so with that, he created a prototype in an afternoon or so. And after a few months, uh, it actually got accepted directly into the Moshi official repo instead of being a separate library. So now it's in Moshi, and you can use it, and it's amazing. Um, Zach also wrote two articles about it that I'm going to link at the end, uh, which are definitely worth reading. So that's really nice. Another thing that happened is Room. So someone opened a bug on, uh, are you familiar with Room? The persistence, yeah, database wrapper stuff, yeah, OK. Um, Someone opened a bug saying that, surprisingly, um, if, you, if you try to gather the, the name of the parameters in, a, in the same module, it's fine. Because the annotation processor, I believe, reads the sources directly or something like that. And it can know the names. That's fine. But if you try to do anything cross-module, or let's say, if you compile a jar of any kind, so a library is a good example, and you try to read the parameter names from there, using purely Java, they are not there. They disappear. Um, that, plus, of course, there were nullability issues and stuff. So they contacted me, and together we found a way to, to make it work so that now they actually use the Kotlin metadata annotations, and they extract the actual real parameter names. And that works across modules, across libraries, and it just works. So they could fix the bugs, and everybody was happy. So that was really nice. One effort that uh, I really had to do to make this work is that before, um, we were essentially shadowing um, the, 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 the Kotlin compiler. Uh, not shadowing, uh, having it as a dependency. So we were depending on the Kotlin compiler, which is not a bad thing per se. Many tools do. But then what happened one day is that um, they broke binary compatibility with the compiler itself, because they added a field that was not there before. And, um, and so suddenly, without even explicitly updating your own Kotlin version, 
in your build, if you pulled in a library that did it for you, that updated Kotlin, you would pull in automatically the new compiler, and so that would just break your build. So just by adding a random library at some point, you would just not build anymore, which was not great. And so in order to fix that and prevent that from happening ever again, um, I had to shadow the entire portion of this that, that does that. And shadowing in Kotlin is interesting because you need to shadow not just the, 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 the bytecode, which is the easy part, but also if you want to do it properly and have the little bits of documentation that are there, you want to shadow the sources as well. And um, changing the package of Kotlin sources is not straightforward because there's many things that can change. There's a metadata involved. It's so um, in the end, I found a way to do it inside the own uh, Kotlin compiler repository. There's, they created a way to do it, and so like, I, I stole that and made it work. It's interesting, even per se, as an entire like, fun project. Uh, there's a repo called Kotlin Compiler Lite, and so you can see that it wraps the original build and just injects inside Gradle things to change it. So, um, Oh, not that room, sorry. That, the other one, yes. All right, so then this happened. So a few weeks ago, a month ago, I don't know, um, JetBrains pinged me saying, hey, we made a thing. So they finally uh, sort of standardized their API around reading and writing the metadata annotations. Right now, it's in the experimental Kotlin X package, um, and it's similar to what uh, my, my prototype does although it's much more based on uh, visitors. So you, if you're familiar with the pattern, you, you pass your own visitor, and you have a few methods. You don't have to override all of them. And it's like, if you are a class, when you visit a method, what do you do? When you visit blah, what do you do, et cetera? Um, while the, my approach was much more like uh, seal classes. So everything is typed, and so you can just iterate over what you like to see and stuff. Um, it's still experimental, but you should definitely take a look and give them feedback because they're looking for it. Um, and that brings up the question of what happens to, to my own library, essentially. Where did the water go? Don't look at me. So um, the idea is that this is amazing and it's an amazing step forward to reading and writing the metadata. But there are more needs than that, like especially for people doing Android or any JVM um, work. We need to be able to handle these types in the context, again, of annotation processing. And annotation processing itself, even just a basic API, it's really not the most straightforward and easy API to use. And so if you add the complexity of this on top of it, making the two worlds match, even with this, it's not easy. So the, the library I created will always be focused on integrating more this with the APT world. And you're going to see more of that. Actually, did I? Yeah. So this is a slide I made on stage while you were waiting outside. The um, roadmap for, for the library. What is it? What's going to happen? So the first thing is that, again, we're going to wrap that properly. But as before, it's going to be shadow. Um, obfuscated actually is the wrong word. It's more like shadow so that we don't depend directly on that dependency. We are going to wrap types and elements, which are the Java API, in an idiomatic coding API. Because one of the problems I had is that all the things you work with are still Java constructs. And so you never know if it's nullable, if it's not nullable. There's no sealed hierarchies of any kind. So it's often very much casting blindly, not even knowing if it's going to work. With this, it's going to make everything just so much easier. Um, one thing that is inside of this and that it has not been exposed yet is that there's a way to map any Java type to Kotlin type and vice versa. Um, it might seem like trivial, but like int is integer, um, but not always. Like It depends on many things. Like There's many mappings, and keeping them up to date by yourself is a waste of your time, for sure. And also, you'll never be as updated as the compiler can be. So exposing this, I think, can be really helpful. And um, Kotlin Poet actually has this need, for example, because they need to often do this kind of transition. 
And that's the other thing, Kotlin pilot integration is one thing that I get, got asked. And um, since they have actually similar models of just representing types, um, integrating them would be super nice and will make generating Kotlin code just so straightforward. Um, and then, last step, documentation. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, it's actually, I, I could use some help in the documenting part, but mostly, the, right now, the documentation you're going to have is uh, showing, like, like watching the examples that people wrote. Surprisingly, despite this being very exotic and, and weird, um, it's surprisingly easy once you get accustomed to it. Like uh, many people do their first experiment and it just works the first time, so that's a good sign, I think. Uh, so yeah, just dig in. Actually, if we have, I think we do have some time, so. Um, I want to show you one example in code, just to see how that is. Um, yeah, because then we're going to have links and wrapping up. So OK, so I'm going to try this. Let's see what happens. Woof. Ooh. And then we do hop. Is everything going to break? Maybe. OK, oh, that's small. Uh, okay, so this is the contrast enough? Oh yeah, it seems so. Okay, so let's take an example. Be da, da, don't start reading. No, no, wait. Ah. <laughs> so you can read. <laughs> um, one of the examples I said uh, in the previous talk during the, the Q&A, because uh, someone asked me, why would you use this? Like, what's an example of something you cannot do without. And the first example that came to my mind was, you know the data classes, they have this copy method, except it's very literally a copy method. So even if you call it without any parameters, it's going to create a copy. If you pass it while giving it the exact same parameter it already had, it will create a copy. And there are times, uh, especially with functional programming and things like that, that you want to compare them before so that every other observer uh, downstream can just check by reference and say, if this is literally the same instance, I'm going to trust that, of course, nothing changed. If it's different, then I'm going to assume the contents have changed. And so I don't even have to check every element again. And so it saves a lot of, of uh, computation. So I was like, could you create extensions over data classes automatically that instead of being called copy are called width? They work exactly the same, but they do a check and if the instance of whatever you pass is the same, or it's equals, um, then it's not going to create a copy but return the same instance. And so that's what I did. Uh, it's a few lines of code, so not even that many. Uh, this is just for extracting the types. Then there's a generator, which is strings. But so I'm going to show you how it is. OK, so we want to grab, of course, so if you've ever seen any uh, annotation processor ever in your life. There's um, a few things you need to do, like what are my annotation types, what is my source version, blah, 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 boring stuff. Um, and then the, the, the meat of everything is this process method. Is it big enough? Can you read? Thumbs up? Um, yeah. yeah, cool. So um, you get a set of uh, type elements, which are the, you can imagine them as this potentially partial types that get, uh, get in while being annotated. And you have a round environment that tells you a few things, like is the annotation done, blah, 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 the, the processing done, et cetera. So what do we do? First thing is we want to say for this annotation name, which is this annotation I created, I'm going to show it to you first. Oh, no jumping? Is it not compiled? Why? Uh, wait, I'm going to show you. So this is literally the runtime component of this. Um, there's an annotation that only has one parameter, extension name. It's by default width. You can customize it to whatever you want, all right? And the other thing is something that just gets used uh, by the code generation for, because it's less code this way. So going back, we say this is the only annotation we are interested in. And so we're going to say, um, please for um, pretty much give me the, the element 
associated with this annotation so that we can match it with other things. And then we're going to say, OK, for every element inside all the elements annotated with this stuff here. Um, so get input from is where this happens. The get input from is this here. So we have this element. And this is the magic. So this is what the library does. It allows you just with a simple extension to get back the metadata. And the metadata here, oh, why is the autocomplete not working? I'm going to try something that's probably going to blow up in my face, but let's see what happens. Uh, what could possibly go wrong? Uh, well, maybe, no, no, still not working. <sighs> JetBrains, why? What have you done? <laughs> all right, all right, it's fine. I'm going to show you from here if I can. Uh, come on. And uh, yes, so the, the metadata you can get back is a seal class. So depending on what type this is, you can actually get class metadata, file metadata, as we saw before, all the different types. So whenever you call um, this, call the metadata, you're going to get back one of those. And then you can just say, is it a Kotlin class metadata, yes or no? Then if it's not, this can only be used on data classes, so explode. Otherwise, we can go on. So the way it works is that there's two parts inside of this um, protocol buffer system. One is the so-called name resolver, which is, um, if you remember before, we had this data uh, field in the annotation. That contains like an array of strings, generally. This name resolver is that array of strings. It allows you to say, given a certain index, please tell me what string was inside of that. And the class proto is the actual protocol buffer, like the automatically generated um, part of it. Um, that allows you to read the bytes directly. So this is a pair that gets extracted from it, and you can get both. And so from there, with these two things, you can extract pretty much whatever you want. So another extension that I did is called extract full name, which is going to be somewhere. I don't even remember where. Can I jump in? Of course I can. Whatever. Um, it takes the class data and it tries to gather the real, actual Kotlin full name. Things like the real package, the real class name. If it's nullable, put the question mark. Uh, if it has generics, put the generics inside. If it has type aliases, actually use the type aliases, etc. cetera. So um, this does that. We just bind it easily in this function to be able to call it quickly. Um, and then. We just do so. Uh, again, name resolver, give me the fully, quiet name, fully qualified name of the class. OK. And of course, it's in a different format, because why not? So we need to replace the, dash, the, the you know, path separators, et cetera. Then we extract the package, same way. We say, give me the fully qualified name, but then actually replace things in a different way. OK. And then, for example, we want to access all the generic type arguments of this class. And so we have a type parameter list. That's great. And so for each type argument, we create our own representation that we're going to pass to the generator, blah, blah, blah. So there's a name, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so just by extracting things like this, so this is a constructor list. You get all the constructors. And you can say there's extensions on it that say, is it the primary constructor? Yes, no, blah, blah, blah. Um, and one by one, we create this wrappers that represent our own uh, information that we need to generate the source code. And then after all of this, we finally have this input that I created. And it's a, just a data class that holds everything we needed to generate the code. If everything works, blah, 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 then we pass to the generator. And the generator does something like, oh, yeah, this defines all those classes we saw before. But it's something like, OK, uh, split up the input in all the different parts. And then um, we have different, so this is the overall structure package, package. There's a main block, and then specific block, which is, again, implementation details, but still. And this is very, very easy. I'm not even using Kotlin Poet, which is probably easier, but at the time I didn't have this. So it's just you know string interpolation. You just say join to string or you know 
just format things the way you want, but now finally you have all the types. And when you do this, now at this point I'm assuming things did not work, but I'm still gonna try. Um, so this is the example we have. This is a test app that has, so a type alias. I try to be as evil as possible, trying to make it go crazy, but it works. And I just annotate this data class with, with methods. That's it. Um, and see how many like generics and nested generics and things that you know are nested in itself like crazy stuff. Uh, and even uh, at some point, I even change the name, or maybe it's not on this branch. Whatever. But so, okay, bad stuff. What happens is this: we get. Uh, are you here? No. Where are you? Da -da, da -da. Yes. Let's see here. No. Yes. Okay. Okay, so, can I, no, I cannot zoom in, of course not. So we get all these files, which are automatically generated. Let's look at them. And so we get something like blah, 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 blah. This is our class, with. And so we can pass uh, whatever, these are the actual um, types and names on the data class. By default, they just read from the data class, et cetera, et cetera, and see how, like this, is fully qualified. Um, and inside, it just says one by one, it checks if it changed, and uh, if it didn't, it returns itself, otherwise it creates the real copy. Okay, and we do this over and over, so this is a simple example. There are more complicated ones. Uh, I even generate, like, with single field extensions that are even more efficient. Um, blah, 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 and I want to show you like a really nasty one, if I can find it. Eh, not really, but let's say this one. So, see how like it's generics here, generics inside, and then this also has generics, and nullability and mutable list, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. but in the end, everything compiles, because even if one detail of this was wrong, it would just not compile at all. So imagine that. And so with this, you can do it. And it might seem a lot right now because it's on a projector uh, and stuff, but uh, if you look at it at your own pace later, I'm sure you can figure it out easily. And it's really um, not that much code. In the end, um, this is the key, of course. And what you get back, you can mostly explore with autocomplete, honestly. Because um, I tried to expose all the hidden things, the things that did not have names, as extensions. And so just by trying to write something, you should probably figure out what's needed. And of course, there's now a few people that have used it, so you should be able to find help if you need to. That being said, I have... Is it going to explode? Dun, 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 dun. Whoa, yeah, it worked. Um, I have a few links, so the first one is the official library. The second one is my library that, again, still has no documentation, but you're very welcome to use it. It's both on JCenter and Maven Central. I had to learn how to publish on Maven Central. It's incredible. Um, you have these two articles by Zach that I really suggest you read because they are not just well written, but interesting and tell an interesting story, and then you have all the annotation processors that are using uh, this so that you can learn what they did and how they did it, etc. The room one is still not updated to the latest version that uses it, but this is the link to master, so you should be able at some point to have it. And yeah, please do have fun and, uh, and explore with this. Um, you can find me on Twitter. You can find in the future the slides, uh, these slides on that link. And uh, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Come on, don't be shy. Okay. Uh, about metadata. Uh, so, if uh, you can actually read metadata and actually in generated code uh, in jars when you actually distribute your app metadata, uh, 
annotation is still in the code. Uh, sorry, say so, again? Uh, when you distribute your app, you compile it to jars or some kind of, to classes, and you still have metadata uh, annotation in yes. here. Yes. So could actually reverse engineers use it content to uh, reverse engineer your code only with this metadata annotation? Well, it doesn't give you anything that um, just unobfuscated bytecode gives you. So sure, you can reconstruct part of the source code. Um, although, like technically now, it's, I don't think it's been done yet, but there's all the tools needed to obfuscate the metadata as well. As long as you keep it consistent, it's fine. And what's going to happen is just that um, you know, when you read a Java file that is obfuscated, it's just like all letters and stuff. So imagine exactly the same, um, but on the Kotlin side. Even more so, you can just, if you're obfuscating, so if you don't care about the usability of your library, you can just literally drop the metadata annotation. You can remove it. And at that point, your code will look like some very weird Java-ish thing. And that's it. So even more obfuscated than normal, I would say. Yeah. So Thanks. You're welcome. Oh, yeah. yeah, so uh, data classes can have a uh, default value for a parameter, right? Mm -hmm. So I wonder if there's any support for reading that default value, because I couldn't ah. find it in reflection and stuff. That is a very interesting thing. Yeah, I was surprised, but then it makes sense. The problem with default values is that they're not just um, constants. They can be any expression. So if you want, you can just say, uh, I don't know, full equals, and then do a database query in line in, in the parameter. Don't do that, but you technically can. And so what happens is that it's equivalent to just calling any method, and so that is compile code. And that's why you cannot find it in the metadata. Uh, you can only know um, if, it is, if it has a default. That's all you can know. And if you look at the implementation of how they do it, it is like literally inside the body of the method itself, so no luck there. So unless you have access to the sources, uh, then there's no way. Sorry. To the gentleman on the back. Hi. Uh, maybe it's not related to talk, but in your idea, you have an interesting uh, ligator phone with uh, three parallel lines. Uh, what is it? It's uh, Fira code or Fira code, I don't know how you call it. I'm going to show you again because I love that font. Uh, no, but what this symbol does actually? Oh, uh -huh -huh. yes, it's even better. I can show you. So this is equals, this is equals equals, this is triple equals. Wow. <laughs> and of course, wait, let me, let me do it again. This is not equals. This is not triple equals. <laughs> Applaud. Magic. I love it. It's so good. There's also arrows. There's stuff. I don't even remember. It's really cool. You should try. Yeah. Someone else? About the font, especially. I really like to talk about it. No? Yeah? Yeah? OK. You can still grab me at any time if I'm not asleep, because I didn't sleep much tonight. So. Thank you very much and have a great conference.